Hello, this is David Diga Hernandez, and you're watching Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. I'm beginning now a new series. I really do sense in my spirit that now is the time to bring you this truth. This message, this series, has been on my heart for quite some time, but I know that this is of the Lord that I bring it to you now. I'm going to give you some hard-hitting truth. I'm going to expose a lot of demonic activity. I'm going to offend some, but my hope is that this truth will liberate many. I want to talk to you about religious spirits. And so for part one of this series on religious spirits, I'm talking to you about a spirit that is so powerful, so deceptive, that it's turning churches into cults. And the truth of the matter is that you may very well be in a church that has turned into a cult without you even realizing it. But I'm gonna give you the signs for recognizing these religious spirits, and I'm gonna teach you how to uproot them and expose them. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me. He's gonna lead you in some very anointed worship, and then don't miss it. We're gonna get right into this message as I begin this new series. All who are thirsty, all who are we, come to the fountain, dip your heart in the streams of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. out to So the spirit of legalism is a very dangerous, very effective religious spirit. Now, when I say religious spirit, I want you to know that I don't mean exclusively demonic activity or a demonic being. What I'm talking about is a paradigm or a mindset or a way of seeing things that is stuck in a certain way. So a religious spirit is an attitude. A religious spirit is a mindset. A religious spirit is a system that 
causes people to be burdened with things that the Bible does not place upon us. Legalism insists on specific practices rather than godly principles. You know, many believers in their walk with Christ go between two extremes. They find themselves going between legalism and liberalism. Now, on the side of legalism, you have all of the constraints. You have all of what people would call holiness, but I think it's a false sense of holiness. On the other side is liberalism. This is where believers think they're free to do anything that they want. They can live however they want, and God won't judge them. Both extremes are demonic. Both extremes are deception. So where do we find the balance? Where do we find the truth? Where do we find our footing and our foundation? The simple truth is that between legalism and liberalism is love. And a love for Jesus is the key to overcoming both. You see, when I'm legalistic, I may have what I call righteousness, but I'll never have joy. And when I'm walking in liberalism, I may have what I call joy, but I'll never have true power. But when I walk in the love of Jesus, when I walk with my heart filled with a passion for his name and for his words, then I will choose to live in holiness because I love him, not because I'm afraid of being punished by God. And I'll have the power. I'll have the freedom. I'll have the joy all at once. So you don't have to choose between legalism and liberalism. You can walk in the love of God, which gives you both benefits. You'll have joy and you'll have power. You'll have freedom and you'll have holiness. It's possible to balance the two. Now, in Luke chapter number 10, verses 38 through 42, we find a very familiar portion of scripture, which tells the story of Mary and Martha. I'll simplify the story for you. Mary and Martha are expecting Jesus into their home. Mary spends the time talking to Jesus, fellowshipping with Jesus, whereas Martha spends the time preparing a meal for Jesus to eat. Now, somebody once asked me in regards to Mary and Martha, what did Mary see that Martha didn't? My response was that they both saw the exact same thing. In fact, they both wanted the exact same thing, to please Jesus. The problem is they went about it in different ways. Now, Mary came to the place of fellowship. Mary came to the place of love. And because of that, she received this thing which would not be taken away from her, which was first love for Jesus. Martha, on the other hand, trying to gain that love, tried to work for it. And because she tried to work for it, she missed what Jesus was already doing for her. Now, let me be very clear here. I'm not saying that you can live any way that you want. In fact, the scripture is very clear that God punishes sin, that sin has consequences. The believer is to live holy and righteously, and the believer is to walk in a reverence toward God so that their life can reflect the godly character that God wants us to have. Now, Having said that, there is also an extreme on the other side where people demand a strict adherence to a set of rules and expectations that God never put on any one individual. So I'm going to read a portion of scripture to you. It's quite long, well, relatively speaking, at least for a teaching like this. But I want to read this to you anyway, and I want you to really listen to the spirit behind what is being said here. The scripture is found in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 6. This is what the Bible says. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Verse 8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In other words, the scripture here is saying that it's done, it's finished. God took care of this. Verse 15, in this way, 
He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. I love that. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying that they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. I love verse 23 because it says, it gives us the reason why people are keen on accepting these rules and regulations as godly standards. The truth is that we feel like we're accomplishing something in our own strength when we're able to hold to these devotions. And because it requires self-denial, because it requires discipline, it makes sense to us that those are the things that God requires. But here the scripture makes it very clear that you're not to condemn anybody for what they eat or for what they drink. You're not to condemn anybody because they don't celebrate the Sabbath like you celebrate it or a ceremony or a certain specific ritual that you think is godly. The issue is not our desire to serve. The issue is the emphasis on the wrong ways to serve. God does not necessarily delight in sacrifices. He delights in pure hearts. Matthew 23, 23 says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So here we see that it's not necessarily the practices that are wrong, it's the denial of the principles behind those practices that creates a religious mindset and a religious bondage. People doing what before they understand why. I'm not saying, therefore, that we should adhere to every strict code and we should adhere to everything that man puts upon us. I'm simply saying that we should do good. We should do things in this world that accomplish things for the gospel's sake. But if the heart behind it is lost, it becomes religious. This burdening of the people, this giving of rules that God did not give to us is partly why Jesus was so angry with the Pharisees. Matthew 23, 13 says, What sorrow awaits you teach teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves and you don't let others enter either. People constantly putting these burdens, these regulations. I'm not talking about God's moral law. I'm not talking about holiness. I'm talking about man-made religious systems and institutions and rules and expectations that the scripture does not place upon us. The Bible makes it very clear that God's commands are not burdensome. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says that exactly. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are are not burdensome. People message me all the time. Um, can I play video games? Is it okay to wear these types of shoes? Is it okay to shop at that mall? Is it okay if I'm on social media? Is it okay if I eat at this kind of restaurant? Is it okay this? Is it okay that? Is it okay this? Is this a sin? Is that a sin? Am I right with God still if I went to this place or that place? Look, We've got to stop living in this religious paranoia. We've got to stop trying to come down to the very last detail of everything that we do. Otherwise, you're going to live in religious paranoia and fear. You're going, to you're going to be living under burdens. Jesus calls this straining at gnats and swallowing camels. You're so fixed on all these little things, yet you miss God. That's what the frustration was with the Pharisees that Jesus had. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 say, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, my teaching, my way of teaching is not necessarily something that doesn't require self-denial. We believe in self-denial. But what Jesus is saying, that there's a simplicity to his teaching. He gives you rest. Do you lack peace? Do you lack rest? Then you're not in the will of God. If the way you serve God takes your peace, if the way you serve God takes your rest, if the way you serve God has you living in a constant paranoia, then you're not under the yoke of Jesus. You're under the yoke of a religious spirit. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40 say, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. See, it begins with love all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at this, verse 40. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Stop worrying about what you eat, what you wear, what day you attend church, how you pronounce the name of God. We have people commenting on our ministry content all the time. Well, he's not talking about the one true God because he didn't say Yeshua or he didn't say Yahweh. Well, look, what about God's name in different languages? What about the phonetic pronunciation that's given to him all around the world? You see, there's a religious uh, scrutiny right there. People are so focused on the very specifics of, of the practice, the pronunciation of the name of God, rather than the principle, the identity of who we're talking about. So they miss the power of God. They miss these things because they're so focused on things that don't matter. Legalism insists on actions to earn salvation. Legalism demands a very strict adherence to a very specific code of conduct. Look, I'm not talking about holiness. I believe in holiness. So I'm not talking about holiness. I'm talking about silliness. There's a big difference between holiness and silliness. There's a big difference between righteousness and nonsense. We must not live in fear, but in the love of God. So religious people will ask this. What about holiness? Well, that depends entirely on what you mean by holiness. If by holiness you mean adhering to man's idea of what I should be doing. If by holiness you mean I subscribe to your program. If by holiness you mean I hold to your set of exact ideas, then no, I don't believe in that form of holiness. But if by holiness you mean living according to the word of God, if by holiness you mean staying away from sin and walking according to the nature of God, then of course I believe in holiness. But we cannot rob that term holiness, give it a different, different definition, and then demand that people adhere to our definition of what holiness is. Now, this is important because a legalistic ministry, a legalistic church, if it is not corrected, will become a cult. Now, I believe, let me say this very clearly, I believe in the church of the living God. I believe in the bride of Christ. I believe in church authority. I believe in pastors as overseers. Look, I myself am under, submitted happily so, under a wonderful man of God who I go to for counsel, who can correct and rebuke me. And I don't give him a hard time about doing it. If he corrects something in me, I take it. And so I want to be very clear here. I'm not giving anyone here an excuse to leave a church because they don't like being told what to do or to stop following the teachings of a man of God or a woman of God because it's challenging you in a deep way. You should be challenged. You should walk in holiness. I'm talking about something completely different. So for the record, I believe in church authority. I believe in the structure of the church. Yes, God has given us a structure. I believe in the system of the church that Christ himself implemented. So no, I'm not like these hippie Christians with hippie theology. No, man, forget the buildings, forget the pastors, forget the churches, forget the organizations. Let's just go out in the streets and be bums and win people for Jesus. That's not what I believe. I believe in structure. I believe in pastoral headship. I'm under it. I'm submitted to it. What I'm talking about is different. So churches can become cults. Men can become cult leaders. Pastors can become cult leaders. Now, when a church is centered around a man and his rules, that's a cult. When the man replaces God, that's a cult. If being right with God requires that I'm right with a man or a woman of God, that's a cult. So, and I'm not talking about bitterness and those sort of things. Of course, your brothers and sisters in Christ 
Of course, we should walk in right relationship with each other if we want God to hear our prayers. What I'm talking about is men or women who will use that biblical principle to their advantage when manipulating people. In other words, if you don't do exactly what I want you to do, and if I disconnect from you because of that, or if you have to disconnect from me because we have a disagreement, and you aren't willing to change your mind, and therefore you're definitely not in the will of God, that's manipulation. I'm not talking about reconciling with one another. I'm not talking about living at peace with your fellow brother or sister in Christ. That's biblical. Absolutely, you need to be right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm talking about those who use it to manipulate people and make it impossible for them to be right with each other unless they adhere exactly to what they want. So here are some signs that you're in a cult, not a church. Number one, righteousness is equated with an extra biblical adherence to a specific set of rules and expectations. In other words, things that are not in the Bible, demands that are not in the Bible. And I'm just going to give you an example here. There was, um, I'm not going to mention any one church in particular, but there was a ministry I was familiar with where if the people didn't come to every service that was available that week, they were considered in rebellion. And they had like six services that week. And if you weren't at each and every one of those early and then stood late to fellowship, then you were considered not right with God because you missed a service and that shows you weren't truly hungry for God. And it shows that you truly didn't want everything God had for you. That's not, that's not biblical. So that's an extra biblical adherence to a specific set of rules and expectations. The next one, right standing with God is connected to right standing with a certain man or woman of God. In other words, I have to be right with them. I have to obey them. I have to have their approval to have God's approval. The next one, the next sign you know you're in a cult, leadership is constantly emphasizing ideas like submission to leadership or submission to the pastor or submission to the vision or submission to the house. Now, it is biblical to be submitted to a man or woman of God. But if this is a constantly running theme, if this is something that is being pushed again and again and again and again, this could be a sign that you're in a cult, not a church. The next sign, leadership is above healthy, respectful questioning. You can never ask them a question. You can never challenge respectfully and privately a view that they hold. You can never disagree without being rebuked or ostracized. You can never disagree without being labeled as rebellious. And I'm not talking about actual rebellious disagreement. I'm talking about specific concerns that you bring respectfully and say, hey, I, I had a question about this or thought about this. That's different. Here's another sign. Members are kept tired, overworked, and unable to do much else besides church and ministry. The reason for this is if you can keep someone tired, you can keep someone susceptible. So some ministries or churches will keep the people working constantly so that they're exhausted. And if exhaustion is encouraged as a spiritual quality, there's a danger sign. Members are afraid to make life decisions without the permission of leadership. Now, I worded this very carefully on purpose. There are two key words, afraid and permission. The people are afraid of leadership. And number two, the leadership grants permission. In other words, not advice, not counsel. They give permission. Now, I believe in godly counsel, and I believe in obeying your pastor, submitting to your pastor, even in seasons where you might disagree. But what this is, is control based on fear. They want to tell you what job you can take. They want to tell you what school you should go to. They want to tell you who you should date. And if for some reason you don't take their advice and you decide to do what's on your heart or what God placed in your spirit and you're labeled as rebellious or disobedient or not serious about following Jesus, then that's a problem. They may say things like, hey, but you gave your life to Jesus, so it's not yours anymore. You can say, yes, I gave my life to Jesus, not to you. And so that's a very important distinction. Again, I believe in pastoral headship. I believe in submission. It's benefited my life greatly. I would not be here today if it wasn't for that. But I'm talking about people who abuse this and they don't lead people. They control people. And that's not godly. The next sign, members who leave, no matter the surrounding circumstances, are labeled as rebellious or outside of the will of God. If there's a pattern in your church of people constantly leaving, it could very well be a problem with leadership, especially if 
everyone who leaves under any circumstance, good or bad, positive or negative, with conflict or without, is labeled as rebellious or outside of the will of God, that might be an issue. In other words, if you're not, if you don't stay connected with me, if you don't stay connected with this church, if you don't stay in this specific place that we've laid out for you and you leave that, you're outside of the will of God. You're in rebellion. You're not truly living for Christ. That is a dangerous sign, especially if this is a pattern. Now, again, sometimes rebellious people do leave churches. It happens all the time. In fact, some people watch this and they use it as an excuse to say, I don't have to be a part of a church. I would encourage you, be a part of a church where you can attend locally and be in accountability towards somebody. But this right here is something else entirely. This is manipulation. This is causing fear. This is basically labeling people so that those who are inside will remain disconnected from them, not to be infected by them. But again, there are some circumstances where rebellious people do leave. There are some circumstances where people do have to be kicked out. And there are some circumstances where people leave ministries and they've left the will of God because of that. That's not what I'm talking about here. Another sign, members are discouraged from fellowshipping with believers from other churches and ministries. Now, this should never be the case unless there is something that the pastor sees as a major doctrinal error. I'm talking about uh, someone who teaches that Jesus didn't rise from the dead or someone who teaches that Jesus is, wasn't God. Those are very good reasons to not fellowship with other churches. But if they don't want people fellowshipping with other churches simply because they're trying to keep everybody collected in one place so that they can look good when they have their crowd everywhere that they go, that's an issue. Or they don't want other people fellowshipping with other churches for the fear that they may go visit that other ministry. That's insecurity and that's an issue. So another sign, members are afraid of missing any church function at any time for any reason for fear of being rebuked, looked down upon, or otherwise ostracized. Say they take an annual family vacation and they go and they're labeled as uncommitted. They're labeled as lukewarm Christians. They're labeled as half-hearted. That's a sign that you could be in a cult instead of a church. The next sign, members are seen as belonging to a certain man or woman of God. In other words, if they go visit another church or they go up to be a part of another ministry and the pastor calls that pastor or the pastor calls that ministry and says, hey, why are you using my people? Why do you have my person there? That's a sign that they see the people as theirs. That's a sign that they see the people as property and not as souls. And that is another sign. Now, again, guys, these are just signs. These are things that have to all add up to create the case. You may see some indications because not every church is perfect. You may see them leaning a little one way or the other way. I'm talking about something very extreme here. So don't, again, hear what I'm not saying. I don't want a mass exodus from people leaving churches. I just want to equip you with some truth. Now, the, the next sign here, and then I'm done, is if you're afraid to assess or even consider these signs, because you are afraid of being embarrassed or ostracized, you may be in a cult. So if you're a member of a church and you're, you're recognizing patterns here, you need to pray. If you're a pastor who hears these signs and says, oh man, are there actually churches like that? Yes, there are. You need to pray God keeps you balanced. Now, if you're someone who's offended by this, you're listening to me and you're saying, how could you say that? People are going to leave my church because of this. Then you need to repent. You need to get yourself right because if all of these signs or even a majority of them describe the way you are running things, you're operating under a spirit of legalism and you need to let God's people go. And that is it for the lesson. I want to pray with you now. I want to pray that God would settle this truth in your heart, that God would give you discernment because remember, you can't make snap decisions. You need to really, really pray about this. You need to really go through this list. Again, there is no such thing as the perfect church. But I want to see people liberated from cults, not from churches with flaws. There is always going to be a flaw in a church. But watch out for these signs. Do they all add up? Are they on the extreme side? Pray through this. Discern through this. Let's believe God for discernment. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for that one receiving this prayer now. And I ask, Lord, that you would give them discernment, open their eyes, and speak to them. And let them be set free from every bit of demonic influence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you agree. Say amen. Now, I know some of you like when I prophesy or give words of knowledge. Sometimes that flows. Remember, this is the Holy Spirit's channel. So 
The words of knowledge may flow sometimes and not other times, but the anointing is still flowing, even if I'm not calling things out. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you and we are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. Be sure to join the Spirit family, now over 7,000 members strong. If you want to join the Spirit family, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. Now to your comments. These comments are from Stephen Moctezuma's teaching. He taught on a deeper level of worship. I was actually out that week because I am now a father to my precious little Aria Rose Hernandez. Jess and I could not be happier with our little miracle. Now, Jess did an amazing job, and Jess is doing an amazing job. She's a great mother. We have a beautiful little girl, and I want to thank all of you who prayed for us. I want to thank all of you who sent in gifts. We got gifts from all over. I hope we were able to send cards to everybody. Um, I hope my office did that. If you didn't get the thank you, let me take this time now to say thank you for what you sent in for her. We so appreciate it. We love you all, and that's why Mr. Stephen Moctezuma filled in for me. He did an amazing job. By the way, he's got to come back and do these again, um, even if I'm still here. But uh, the first comment from that particular video I'm going to read is from Mia Sarek, who writes, Brother Stephen, you preach from the heart of worship. Great job. Loved your personal truths as well. God bless you and your family. Sizzling writes, God bless you, Brother Stephen. May the Lord enrich you all the days of your life. Loved the teaching. Corey Smoot writes, Stephen and Nick, thank you guys for glorifying God with the beautiful worship music and keeping the ministry going. Well, Evangelist Hernandez is enjoying his new bundle of joy. Congratulations and may God richly bless everyone in this ministry. Samuel Reyes writes, thank you, Stephen Moctezuma, for the message you brought today from the Lord. May God continue to use you and David Hernandez in the teachings and worship. Your worship music moments makes my heart relax in God's presence. God bless you. Stephanie Loves Jesus writes, Congratulations, David and Jessica. I became a partner today. I only found out about Spirit Church just a few days ago and have been so blessed. Thank you, David, for your great and such amazing teachings. Thank you, Stephen. Your music blesses my heart. Love, Stephanie. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for writing in to us. And thank you, everyone, for writing in to us in the comment section. By the way, if you'd like me to possibly read your comment on the next edition of Spirit Church, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section right now, whether that's on Facebook or on YouTube in the app, wherever it is, if you can leave a comment there, my team will go through it and we'll feature some of the comments next week. Also, while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so that you can receive notifications. Now, as Stephanie said here, she became a partner with us. And really, that's how we keep all of this content going. You know, nowadays, Everything is being sold. People are selling their content. They're charging registration fees for their events. But we as a ministry want to leave our content free and we want to leave our events open for free for the most part. There are some very specific instances like sometimes Steve and I will be invited to minister at someone else's conference. Obviously, if they charge, that's on them. But for the ministry, we want to try to make as much of it available for free as possible. This is why we need your help. Consider today becoming my partner for $30 or more a month. I'll appreciate it. Steve will appreciate it. Jess will appreciate it. My little Aria Rose will appreciate it. We'll thank you for it. And just to say thank you for partnering with us, I will send you either Carriers of the Glory, Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible, or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. If you sign up for $30 or more a month, do that today. Everything helps. Now is the time to step in and help us win souls and build believers through events and media. This ministry is growing. As you can see, the events are growing. Let's continue to do this, guys. Stand with us. Join us in our efforts to preach the gospel and spread the truth all around the world. Sign up for a one-time gift or a monthly gift today. Everything counts. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.